analysis of our sacred lands by chief theater the speech and the letter as usual i manusha tenakon i would like to remind you all to subscribe my youtube channel for more educational videos like this content of today's presentation number 1 what is a prose number 2 types of prose number 3 chief theatrical biography number 4 synopsis of the speech by theatrical number 5 synopsis of the letter by theatrical number 6 themes of the speech and the letter by theatrical what is a prose it is important to get an understanding on prose here under the presentation analysis of our sacred land by chief seattle because the sacred land comes under prose in your literature syllabus prose is a style of writing that does not follow a strict structure of rhyming and o meter prose uses normal grammatical structures elements of prose writing include regular grammar and paragraph structures that organize ideas prose comes from the latin proso oratio meaning straight forward types of prose basically we can divide prose into two types non fictional prose non fiction is a work of writing that is based on fact Examples of non-fiction include memoirs, essays, instructions, biographies, etc. Fictional prose. Fiction is a genre of writing that is imagined or untrue. Novels use prose in order to tell stories. Subgenres of fiction can include fantasy, historical fiction, science fiction, etc. Chief Seattle biography Chief Seattle was born somewhere around 1790 near Blake Island Washington Being the son of a Squamish father and Duwamish mother he gained influence in both tribes He was tall and broad standing nearly 6 feet tall Hanson Bay Company traders gave him the nickname Lee Gross meaning the big guy he was a leading figure among his people and he was known widely for ambushing and defeating groups of tribal enemies he was also known as an orator and when he addressed an audience his voice was loud and bold even though he was a brave man and a courageous warrior known for defeating big armies of enemy tribal raiders he began to gradually lose his powers when the white settlers began invading the tribal lands knowing that it was not possible to defeat the more powerful europeans he chose to form friendly relations with the settlers he developed a personal relationship with doc menard a doctor and a businessman who supported chief seattle chief seattle died on 7th of june 1866 in bainbridge island washington after his death a city in the pacific northwest of usa was named as seattle the city seattle was surrounded by water mountains and evergreen forest and contains thousands of acres of parkland seattle is the largest city in washington synopsis of the speech by seattle here on your right hand side you can see seattle speech on your left hand side a synopsis is available in red color yonder sky that has web tears of compassion upon my people for centuries untold and which to us appears changeless and eternal 
may change. Today is fair. Tomorrow, it may be overcast with clouds. Here, Chief Seattle starts the speech describing his land, which has been compassionate towards the Native Americans all through the years. It has always appeared to his people as changeless and eternal. However, this situation is on the verge of transformation. My words are like the stars that never change. Whatever Seattle says, the great chief at Washington can rely upon with as much certainty as he can upon the return of the sun or the seasons. The wise chief says that big chief at Washington sends us greetings of friendship and goodwill. This is kind of him for we know he has little need of our friendship in return. His people are many. They are like the grass that covers vast prairies. My people are few. They resemble the scattering trees on a storm swept plain. The great and I presume good white chief sends us words that he wishes to buy our land but is willing to allow us enough to live comfortably. Uh, my words are like the stars that never change. The big chief at Washington sends us greetings of friendship and goodwill. Here, Chief Seattle is giving a very strong assurance about himself. This indeed appears just, even generous, for the red man no longer has rights that he need respect and the offer may be wise also as we are no longer in need of an extensive country. This shows that the red man no longer has the rights he has had till now. There was a time when our people covered the land as the waves of a wind ruffled sea covers its self-paved floor. But that time long since passed away with the greatness of tribes that are now but a mournful memory. I will not dwell on, no mourn over, our timely decay, no reproach my pale face brothers with hastening it, as we too may have been somewhat to blame. Here, Seattle recalls his memory on the past and compares it to the present situation. There was a time when our people ruled the land, but that too has become a mournful memory. Youth is impulsive. When our young men grow angry at some real or imaginary wrong and disfigure their faces with black paint, it denotes that their hearts are black and that they are often cruel and friendless and our old men and old women are unable to restrain them. Thus, it has ever been. Thus, it was when the white man began to push our forefathers ever westward. But, let's hope that the hostilities between us may never return. We would have everything to lose and nothing to gain. Revenge by young men is considered gain, even at the cost of their own lives. But, Old men who stay at home in times of war and mothers who have sons to lose know better. The chief goes on to say that young people are prone to aggression. They would want to revenge on the white people, but the older generation is wise and would never want to get into any hostility. Our good father in Washington, for I presume he is now our father as well as yours, since K 
King George has moved his boundaries further north. Our great and good father, I say, sends us word that if we do as he desires, he will protect us. His brave warriors will be to us a bristling wall of strength and his wonderful ships of war will fill our harbors so that our ancient enemies far to the northward behind us and Simshians will cease to frighten our women, children and old men. Then in reality he will be our father and we his children. But can that ever be? Your God is not our God. Your God loves your people and hates mine. He folds his strong protecting arms lovingly about the pale face and leads him by the hand as a father leads an infant son. But he has forsaken his red children. If they really are his, our God, the great spirit seem also to have forsaken us. Here, Chief Seattle feels that God of the white people is biased and hates the Native Americans. Moreover, his own God has also abandoned them. Your God makes your people wax stronger every day. Soon they will fill all the land. Our people are ebbing away like a rapidly receding tide that will never return. The white man's God cannot love our people or he would protect them. They seem to be orphans who can look nowhere for help. According to how Chief Seattle thinks, uh, his people have become orphans who can look nowhere for help. They are decreasing in number and will soon cease to exist. How then can we be brothers? How can your God become our God? and renew our prosperity and awaken in us dreams of returning greatness. If we have a common heavenly father, he must be partial, for he came to his pale-faced children. We never saw him. He gave you laws but had no word for his red children, whose Teeming multitudes once filled this vast continent as stars fill in the firmament. No, we are two distinct races with separate origins and separate destinies. There is little in common between us. Here, Seattle says that we are two distinct races with separate origins and separate destinies. There is little that is common between us. This part of the speech shows very clearly the sound awareness of Seattle about what is going to happen. To us, the ashes of our ancestors are sacred and their resting place is hallowed ground. You wander far from the graves of your ancestors and seemingly without regret. Your religion was written upon tablets of stone by the iron finger of your God so that you could not forget. The red man could never comprehend or remember it. Our religion is the tradition of our ancestors, the dreams of our old men, given them in solemn hours of the night by the great spirit, and the visions of our Saicham and is written in the hearts of our people. Here, Chief Seattle contrasts the position given to ancestors and the practice of religion in both races, the white and the red. To us, the ashes of our ancestors are sacred. You forget your ancestors without any regret. Your religion was written on tablets of stones for you to strictly remember, but the red man can never understand or remember it. Our religion is the tradition of our ancestors and the dreams of our old men.
you are dead cease to love you and the land of their nativity as soon as they pass the portals of the tomb and wander away beyond the stars they are soon forgotten and never return our dead never forget this beautiful world that gave them being they still love its verdant valleys its murmuring rivers its magnificent mountains silk stirred vales and verdant link lakes and bays and ever yearn in tender fond affection over the lonely hearted living and often return from the happy hunting ground to visit guide console and comfort them here chief seattle says that their forefathers never forget their land and them even after they are dead you are dead cease to love you and the land of their nativity as soon as they die but our dead never forget this beautiful world they love its verdant valleys its murmuring rivers its magnificent mountains sequestered vales and verdant link lakes and bays day and night cannot dwell together the red man has ever fled the approach of the white man as the morning mist flees before the morning sun however your proposition seems fair and i think that my people will accept it and will retire to the reservation you offer them then we'll dwell apart in peace for the words of the great white chief seem to be the words of nature speaking to my people out of dense darkness it matters little where we pass the remnants of our days they will not be many the indians night promises to be dark not a single star of hope hovers above his horizon sad voice winds mourn in the distance grim fate seems to be on the red man's trail and whenever he will hear the approaching footstep of his fell destroyer and prepare stolidly to meet his doom as does the wounded dog that hears the approaching footstep of the hunter a few more moons a few more winters and not one of the descendants of the mighty hosts that once moved over this broad land or lived in happy homes protected by the great spirit will remain to mourn over the graves of a people once more powerful and hopeful than yours but why should i mourn at the untimely fate of my people tribe follows tribe and nation follows nation like the waves of the sea it is the order of nature and regret is useless your time of decay may be distant but it will surely come for even the white man whose god walked and talked with him as friend to friend cannot be exempt from the common destiny we may be brothers after all we will see this contains the saddest part of seattle's speech he is fully aware on the dark side of their future but they do not have any other option than agreeing this proposition he addresses the white people saying that he would think over their proposition and then decide what to do uh, we will ponder your proposition and when we decide we will let you know but should we accept it i hear and now make this condition that we will not be denied the privilege without more station of visiting at any time the tombs of our ancestors friends and children every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people every hillside 
every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. Even the rocks which seem to be dumb and dead, as the swelter in the sun along the silent shore, thrill with memories of stirring events connected with the lives of my people, and the very dust upon which you now stand responds more lovingly to their footsteps than yours, because it is rich with the blood of our ancestors, and our bare feet are conscious of the sympathetic touch. Here, Seattle says that he accepts the proposition offered by the white, but that is with a condition. When they leave from their native land, they should be allowed to visit the tombs of their ancestors at any time. This is an innocent request. If he accepts it, his people should not be denied the privilege on visiting the tombs of their ancestors, friends and children. Our departed braves, fond mothers, glad, happy-hearted maidens, and even the little children who lived here and rejoiced here for a brief season, will love these somber solitudes, and at eventide they greet shadowy returning spirits. And when the last red man shall have perished, and the memory of my tribe shall have become a myth among the white men, these shores will soar with the invisible dead of my tribe. And when your children's children think themselves alone in the field, the store, the shop upon the highway, or in the silence of the pathless woods, they will not be alone. In all the earth, there is no place dedicated to solitude. At night, when the streets of your cities and villages are silent and you think them deserted, they will throng with the returning host that once filled them and still love this beautiful land. The white man will never be alone. Let him be just and deal kindly with my people. For the dead are not powerless. Dead, did I say? There is no death, only a change of words. Here, Seattle highlights the fact that the white will never be alone, even at night, because the streets of the cities of white men uh, will be filled with the spirits of dead red men. At night, when the streets of your cities and villages are silent, and when you think them deserted, our dead will revisit this beautiful land. The white man will never be alone. Now, let's pay our attention to the synopsis of the letter by Seattle. The president in Washington sends word that he wishes to buy our land. But how can you buy or sell the sky, the land? The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, how can you buy them? Here, Seattle is presenting the background information for his letter. He is writing this letter as a reply for the request made by the president in Washington. He explains very strongly that buying or selling a land is totally strange to them. Every part of the earth is sacred to my people. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every meadow, every humming insect, all are holy in the memory and experience of my people. Seattle expresses how each part of nature becomes sacred 
in the memory and experience of his people. We know the sap which courses through the trees as we know the blood that courses through our veins. We are part of the earth and it is part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters. The bear, the deer, the great eagle, these are our brothers. The rocky crest, the dew in the meadow, the body heat of the pony, and man all belong to the same family. For Seattle and his people, parts of nature, whether they be animate or inanimate, are very intimate like brothers and sisters of a same family. The shining water that moves in the streams and rivers is not just water, but the blood of our ancestors. If we sell you our land, you must remember that it is sacred. Each glossy reflection in the clear waters of the lakes tells of events and memories in the life of my people. The waters murmur is the voice of my father's father. Here, Seattle assures that water flowing in the rivers is none other than the blood of his forefathers. Further, he compares the murmuring sound of water to the voice of his grandfather. The rivers are our brothers. They quench our thirst. They carry our canoes and feed our children. So you must give the rivers the kindness that you would give any brother. Seattle is asking the white president to treat nature kindly because nature fulfills human needs. If we sell you our land, remember that the air is precious to us, that the air shares its spirits with all the life that it supports. The wind that gave our grandfather his first breath also received his last sigh. The wind also gives our children the spirit of life. So, if we sell our land, you must keep it apart and sacred as a place where man can go to taste the wind that is sweetened by the meadow flowers. Seattle is requesting vehemently from the white president not to pollute the air because air gives spirits to lives and is precious to them. Indirectly, he is asking the white president not to deforest their land after they purchased it. Will you teach your children what we have taught our children? That the earth is our mother. What befalls the earth befalls all the sons of the earth. Here he highlights how they taught their younger ones the importance of nature and he expects the same to be taught by the white to their younger ones. This we know, the earth does not belong to man, man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Seattle shows his wit in this description. People today try to overpower the earth and nature and at last they summon troubles to them. Universal truth is that man belongs to the earth and earth does not belong to man. Harming earth is harming mankind. One thing we know, our God is also your God. The earth is precious to him and to harm the earth is to heap contempt on its creator. Seattle logically explains here how God becomes unsatisfied with what people do. Your destiny is a mystery to us. What will happen when the buffalo are all slaughtered? The wild horses tamed? 
what will happen when the sacred corners of the forest are heavy with the scent of many men and the view of the ripe hill is blotted with talking wires where will the thicket be gone where will the eagle be gone and what is to say goodbye to the swift pony and then hunt the end of living and the beginning of survival here seattle indirectly warns the british rulers of their short sighted journey he warns of where they will stop after they damage nature and animals in it according to seattle they will stand at the beginning of survival when the last red man has vanished with this wilderness and his memory is only the shadow of a cloud moving across the prairie will the shores and forest still be here will there be any of the spirits of my people left here seattle presents a rhetorical question will there be any of the spirit of my people left we love this earth as a newborn loves its mother's heartbeat so if we sell you our land love it as we have loved it care for it as we have cared for it hold in your mind the memory of the land as it is when you receive it preserve the land for all children and love it as god loves us as we are part of the land you too are part of the land this earth is precious to us it is also precious to you here seattle highlights how they love this earth using a beautiful simile and he requests white people to to love this earth in the same way further he request white people to preserve the land for future generation then he explains the inseparable attachment between land and the man one thing we know there is only one god no man be he red man or white man can be apart we are all brothers after all Seattle ends his letter with a strong conclusion irrespective of color whether it is white or red we all are brothers themes of the speech and the letter by seattle there are many themes of the speech and the letter by chief seattle but here we'll focus on three themes the oppression of the white man over the natives traditionally as far as the seattle's interpretation of history goes the indigenous people of america were savage godless beast however chief seattle's speech opened up a new perspective for the world to see this recorded piece of text is proof of the native americans rich culture and history and tells us of their share of the story therefore the oppression of the white man over the natives can be considered a major theme of the speech ecological responsibility the environment also plays a central role in the text and the strikingly poignant manner in which nature has been portrayed here appeals to the sentiment of the masses seattle also puts forward his arguments in favor of ecological responsibility and respect of native americans land rights the relevance if chief seattle speech in correct time is that the speech highlights the disregard for the environment displayed by white people it also emphasizes the destruction of ecological equilibrium and make a case for the preservation of nature thus the speech receives tremendous praise actually this message seems specially relevant today 
as humankind fight desperately against climate change and the impact his action has had on nature. Mutual respect for each other's way of living. Chief Seattle's speech is a brilliant document of folk wisdom advocating coexistence of races and mutual respect for each other's way of living. It has gained immense popularity through the ages thanks to its emphasis on the themes of love, brotherhood and coexistence. Dear students, we have come to the end of today's presentation and I hope you have got a very clear understanding about the speech and the letter by Chief Seattle. And I hope you did not forget to subscribe my channel for more educational videos like this. Thank you.